If you have 2,000, 12,000, if you have $12,721.89, you can buy one ounce of the most expensive perfume that is today on the market. But that extravagance literally pales next to the passage that we are about to read. I invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 14 and let's read together verses 1 through 9. Mark 14 verses 1 through 9. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him, that is Jesus, by trickery, and put him to death. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany, at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came, having an alabaster flask, a very costly oil of spikenard. Then she brought the flask and broke it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And, and they criticized. They criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And when you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She's done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, Wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. In this reading, we find ourselves in the last week of Jesus' life, that which we often call the Passion of Christ. But even further in this reading, we not only find ourselves in the passion of Christ, we find ourselves observing the action of someone who had a passion for Christ. I ask you this morning, do you have a passion for Christ? As we contemplate our assignment, didn't Mary have cheaper perfume? I would like for us to do two things. First of all, I would like for us to direct our attention right back to these nine verses and consider an explanation of the text. And then having done so in the second place, I would like for us to branch our thoughts away and engage in an evaluation from the text to see if indeed we, like Mary, have a passion for Christ. Let's begin with an explanation of the text. In so doing, we will find, first of all, reference to a chronology. Verse 1 says, after two days it was the Passover. Now you and I, from our knowledge of Old Testament history, remember that the Passover was one of three pilgrimage feasts of the Jewish religion. We will also remember from verses like Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 and following, that the Passover had a special significance. So special that as a result of Exodus 15, verse 1, God said, I'm changing your calendar. From now on, the first day of the first month is the Passover. 
And so their whole calendar changed because of the Passover. Not only did it have special significance, it had an historical significance. You remember the Passover was instituted to help Jews remember the passing over of the death angel who went throughout the land of Egypt taking the lives of all the firstborn who were not inside a house marked by blood. It also had an agricultural significance in that this was a time for the ingathering of the barley harvest. So that's where we are in the calendar year as far as the Jews' calendar is concerned, the first month of their year. Our passage says we're at two days before the Passover feast and the days subsequent called the days of unleavened bread. Now it's at this particular time that the Sanhedrin behind closed doors began to plot for the execution of our Lord. And as you continue to read verses 1 and 2, you'll find that they decided they would engage in their plot, but not until after the Passover feast because there were so many people. As we contemplate the chronology, verse 3 goes on to say, and being in Bethany. Now Bethany was a sleeper town some two miles from what we would think of as downtown Jerusalem. It would be, say, the distance between Severeville, Tennessee and Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. So indeed Jesus is close by the capital and religious of the religious and civil capital of the Jews, Jerusalem. John tells me that Jesus made his way to Bethany not just two days before the Passover, but rather six days before the Passover feast. Perhaps that's because of what we're experiencing here just a few days before the eclipse with traffic being all that it is, people trying to get the place they want to get to to observe the eclipse. You see, when it came to the Passover, we were told that the 50,000 residents of Jerusalem literally exploded to 250,000. And so Jesus makes his way many days prior, and he finds himself two miles away in the city of Bethany. But now as we continue to engage in our explanation of the text, we find reference to a celebration. For verse 3 continues, being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. As he sat at the table, a woman came. Now when I take Matthew cha Mark chapter 14 and place it alongside what I read in Matthew 26 and John chapter 12, I see the picture began to fill out some. First of all, Jesus is at the house of Simon the leper, and John tells me they prepared a supper for him. This is a dinner that has been made in honor of Jesus. This is, as we would say, an honor to whom honor is due occasion. He is in the house, our passage says, of Simon the leper. Do not miss a reference to the definite article, the leper. It's of interest to me that this man named Simon is known because of his illness. And isn't it true that chronic illness can somewhat consume our identity? Oh, you know, she's the one that has. Oh, you know, he's the one that struggles with. And so it is with Simon, who was known as the one with leprosy. But hold on a minute. This passage tells us that Jesus is engaged socially with Simon the leper. If I remember the Old Testament book of Leviticus, when an individual had leprosy, the individual had to rip up their clothes, they had to bare their heads, they had to cover their mustache and cry out, unclean, unclean, and they had to live outside of the camp, socially ostracized. 
But this man is sitting at the table in his house with Jesus of Nazareth, suggesting to us Simon the leper had been healed. I wonder who healed him. But also John tells me that Martha served at that meal. Martha, the sister of Lazarus, and I'm reading that in John 12, it's in the previous chapter, John 11, that Martha and Mary's brother Lazarus is raised from the dead by Jesus. So here is an occasion of celebration in the house of Simon the leper who's celebrating being cleansed of leprosy sitting at a table where Martha is serving, celebrating the resurrection of her brother. This is a time of great celebration. Our passage says that a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. I will not know the identity of that woman as I read Matthew and Mark, but John tells me that woman is none other than the other sister of Lazarus, Mary. And she comes with this alabaster flask full of costly oil of spikenard, an oil that was extracted from a plant, the root of a plant that was grown in India. Again, extremely costly. In fact, as you observe the criticism, you will find that it could have been sold for 300 denarii. Matthew 20, verse 1, a single denarii was a day's wage. In essence, the criticism said this could have been sold for a year's worth of salary. Now, I want you to think about what you make in a year. 35000 45000 60000 can you imagine spending $60,000 to buy one bottle of perfume for your wife's Christmas? I hope you can imagine that. If you like my household, it's only honey in your dreams. <laughs> but that's what's happened here. A woman took a bottle of perfume that was worth a year's salary. And the passage says she broke it and poured it on Jesus' head. Matthew and Luke use the word anointed his head. Taking me back to Old Testament teachings, you anointed the head of a prophet, you anointed the head of a priest, you anointed the head of a king. Jesus indeed is the one through whom God speaks to man today, prophet. Jesus is the one who makes purification of our sins today, priest. And Jesus today is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And she anointed his head with oil. But John tells me that even further, she took this same oil and anointed his feet. And then, of all things, wiped his feet with her hair. Women on this occasion did not unveil their head and loosen their head, their hair, unless they were loose women. Think of the reputation that was on the line as Mary engages in this gesture. So some are engaged in a gesture of emotion. One is engaged in a gesture of devotion, a time of celebration. Our explanation of the text next brings us to a criticism. Verse 4 says, There were some who were indignant among themselves. Indignant translates a word that is really two put together. The first one means much, and the next one means arm. They were much arm. We might say they were much up in arms, or we might say they tried to strong arm this woman with intimidation in their response to her gesture of devotion. They were indignant among themselves. Who are they? Matthew tells me the disciples, the apostles. John tells me that it was Judas who was taking the lead in all of this criticism. Well, I keep reading, and verse 5 says, they criticized her sharply. The word translated criticized sharply literally means to snort like a horse toward her. 
Wouldn't this have been sold for a year's salary and used for the poor? And thus, the criticism. Well, last of all, our explanation of the passage takes us to the commendation of Jesus for Mary. His commendation is twofold. First of all, he protected her. He said, let her alone. The word that is translated, uh, theomy, is actually the same root term that is translated remission or forgiveness. It means to liberate. It means to free. Jesus is saying, free her from the entanglement of your criticism. Release her from all of your indignant thinking. You leave her alone. He protected her in his commendation and then he praised her. She has done a good work. He went on to say in verse 7 that the poor were always there and you could do good works for them. Of interest to me, you see the word good twice, once in verse 6 and once in verse 7, but they translate two different words. The one in verse 7, doing good for the poor, is a word that means do things well in behalf of the poor. But the word that Jesus used to describe the devotion of Mary is kalos, it means beautiful. Listen to what he said. He praises her. You leave her alone. She's done something beautiful for me. And thus an explanation of a passage that tells us here is a woman with a passion for Christ. Brother Dan, you miss verse 9. Oh no. You hold on to that. But as for now, let's shift gears and reason from beyond our text in an application of the same. Let's make an evaluation of ourselves. Actually, there are three different kinds of people that are found in our passage. You have the expressive, Simon, Martha, celebrating their appreciation for Christ. You have the excessive, Mary, with extreme devotion and sacrifice. And then you have the expulsive, Judas and the apostles criticizing her for her gesture. Today you fall into one of those three categories. Which? For the next few minutes I would like for us to think, I would like to address four groups of people and ask us to put a finger on the pulse of our passion for Christ. I would like to begin to speak by speaking to the church as a whole, the brotherhood, our fellowship, the kingdom. You tell me that the church of my Lord is not a denomination. And I believe that with all of my heart. But then we speak as though she is. That's a Church of Christ school. He's a Church of Christ preacher. I was raised Church of Christ growing up. And I wonder if the culture of the time and Christendom at large has not encouraged us to make do with a cheaper perfume. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, you're an elect race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You are his God's own special people. Verse 10 describes them or identifies them. You who were no people but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy but have now obtained mercy. God's chosen people are those who have known God's forgiveness by obeying God's will. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the church of our Lord. Let's not be satisfied with a cheaper perfume. 
speaking to the church. You tell me that we live by the teachings of Scripture, and I believe that with all of my heart. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles, the words of God, 1 Peter 2, verse 10. But then by observation I watch, and in the church I see personal preference take the place of doctrinal purity. Well, what do you think instead of what he thinks? Well, what do you say instead of what he says? Flip the coin, I see at the same time the traditions of men replacing the truth of God as the standard for conduct and practice. We idolize the past, we paralyze the present, and I can't help but wonder have we settled for a cheaper perfume? All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. We live by a thus saith the Lord, regardless of what you want. We live by a thus saith the Lord regardless of what you have done or are used to. It is what God says that counts or it is a cheaper perfume. Speaking to the church, we hear about the alt-right in politics and the alt-left. Have you heard those words lately? Aren't you glad we don't have a problem like that in the church? We have the alt-right in the church, or rather the alt-left in the church, that criticize others that won't goose-step to their loosening where God has not loosened, living without restraint. At the same time, we have those to the alt-right that are ostracizing others in the church because they are binding where God is not bound when they constantly say, you can't. I know we are to be a people of balance, but I wonder if we have forgotten the words of Ezekiel chapter 37, which says, Be not overmuch righteous. Be not overmuch righteous. Ecclesiastes 7, I should say. Verse 16, Nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourselves? All right? Listen. Do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? Alt left, listen. It's in that passage where extremism among God's people are directly attached to death and destruction. You tell me to be balanced, and then we find ourselves literally splitting and splintering over all sorts of things. Worship formats. Bible translations, the working of the Holy Spirit, the buildings that we build, what we can do inside those buildings that we build. Have we settled for a cheaper perfume? Well, ladies and gentlemen, is the passion for Jesus the Christ. Let me speak for a few minutes to congregations of the church. When a missionary comes to the elders or to the mission committee and the missionary literally begs for money so that he can take his family to a place we don't want to go and he's turned down because of budget restraints and building projects, have we settled for a cheaper perfume? The Bible still says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Congregations, you tell me that our preachers aren't to be called pastor, but then we turn them into office managers. We turn them into professionals that are 
equivalent to hospice caregivers without the credentials. We turn them into a cross between a fuller brush salesman and an Avon lady that go house to house trying to get people committed to Jesus the Christ. When the Bible says preach the word, individuals who are striving to preach the word are not pastors, but we've turned them into pastors and come Sunday morning, they don't have anything to say because they haven't had the time because they're trying to live up to our expectations. I'm here to tell you, we've settled on a cheaper perfume. Elders in the church, congregations of the church, there are elders that don't even know the names of members in their flock. They have no idea as to the crises that are going on in the families that they're supposed to be overseeing. They never evangelize, teach Bible classes, but they'll meet on occasion, if not regularly, in a small little room and make decisions that few understand and even less know. Have we settled on a cheaper perfume? Boy, I'm reminded of what I read in Ezekiel 34. Such and such took, such took place because there was no shepherd. You tell me that an eldership is the, are the shepherds, then start acting like shepherds. I would like for us to think a little bit about couples or parents. When courtship is bliss and marriage is blister been there because we do not continue to invest in a relationship have we settled on a cheaper perfume when the marriage is to be had in honor Hebrews 13:4 when our children can give us the names of the starting lineups of their favorite football or baseball teams and the names of people that are on the injured reserve list but they can't name the 12 apostles or the first Christian martyr, have we settled on a cheaper perfume? Those of us who are to bring them up in the chastening and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6 verse 4. When as couples we are more concerned about the securities of our portfolios, then we are our eternal security, avoiding a fiery inferno. Are we settling on a cheaper perfume? Jesus said, be, watch, be ready for the hour you know not. Matthew 22, 44. I'd like to close by speaking to each of us as individual Christians. When we live in palaces with well-groomed yards and flower beds, but we go on Sunday morning to a church building that has wallpaper peeling off and, ch and paint chipping, and a yard that looks like it hasn't been mowed for two and a half weeks, and flower beds that look like it would be a great place for a family of deer to bed down at night, Have we settled on a cheaper perfume? When we are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world to the glory of God, our Heavenly Father. As individual Christians, we read popular mechanics, Sports Illustrated, not the swimsuit edition, McCall's, National Geographic, but nowhere in the house will you find a copy of the Gospel Advocate, Christian Woman, Discovery for Children, Spiritual Sword. Have we settled on a cheaper perfume, those of us who are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior? 2 Peter 3 verse 18. Those of us who are to hunger and thirst after righteousness, when we refer our friends to an insurance agent, a doctor, a banker, 
But we will not tell that friend about Jesus Christ who can give them eternal salvation. Have we settled on a cheaper perfume? What about verse 9? In verse 9 of our passage, Jesus closes his commendation of Mary by saying, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached, in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial. Well, sure enough, who are we talking about this morning? And that, ladies and gentlemen, because she did not settle for a cheaper perfume. She had a passion for Jesus the Christ. Do you? Hopefully, people can think of your name and say, he or she is a beautiful thing for God. If not, maybe his invitation at this moment needs to be yours as we stand together and sing.